Running a restaurant is hard. Fire everything right now! Yes, yes. Managing a virtual restaurant is even harder. Today, we will dissect the $100 million counter lawsuit virtual dining concepts has slapped on Mr. Beast. Why did the partnership get to this point? Is Mr. Beast in a financial soup? And how does this affect the future of commercial food? Jimmy Donaldson, aka Mr. Beast, launched Beast Burger, and it was like the Super Bowl of restaurants in Wilson, North Carolina. Free burgers to people who showed up at the drive thru hundreds of orders processed. Most people got paid to stop by and one of them even got a car. Isn't that just wonderful? A 20 mile line back up and police intervention to shut them down. It was a launch like none other for a virtual restaurant chain with more than 300 locations in North America. Incredibly well begun is definitely half done, right? Apparently not. Cut to the present, and Virtual Dining Concepts is countersuing Jimmy for a massive $100 million in damages to the Mr. Beast Burger Company. So, how did we get from this to this? Let's take a step back and dig deeper into the restaurant business, because it's critical to understand that before we look at Mr. Beast's burger lawsuit. A typical restaurant has to adhere to 27 regulations based on jurisdiction and the type of restaurant. We're talking about how food is stored, prepared, and cooked, how sanitized the restaurant should be, the way food is handled through the supply chain, what temperature and contamination measures look like. This goes into detail about employee training, safety, environment regulations, yada yada yada. There's even a law about truth in advertising, where any claims made in marketing or menus must be legitimate. We'll come back to this later. Forget about happy customers, just running a regular restaurant is not a piece of cake, nor is it easily scalable. Mr. Beast, on the other hand, is all about scale and velocity. He spends seven to eight million dollars a month on the merch store, Feastables, Mr. Beast Burger, his main channel, and all his other channels. Building a $14 million HQ building for his production work, additional land for the extravagant videos, and reinvesting all of his money primarily back in the main channel. I mean, just take the Squid Game video production for example. An ex-NASA engineer fabricated the squibs, a set production expert recreated the scary doll contraption, and hundreds of others helped recreate every single game. Managing 456 contestants, rebuilding the arena, the games, and post-production, all in less than a month. I am sure the preparation started way before. I mean, the creators of Squid Game couldn't do this if they tried. It feels like everything just falls into place for Jimmy, but the reality is he makes it happen. He has somehow mastered the art of speed and accuracy of video production. It's very similar to Mark Zuckerberg's philosophy of move fast and break things. Zuckerberg, even at millions of active users, hired engineers who would release code directly into production. The engineers could visibly see their impact as their code affected millions of users in a matter of days, not months. Now, there's a reason I think Zuckerberg, Elon, and Bezos don't actively run and own restaurants, and the answer is more than just scalability. This is something Jimmy would unfortunately learn the hard way. To understand the Beast Burger lawsuit better, it's important to look at the commercial food industry, especially restaurants, in detail. Food supply chain is not ironclad and is deeply affected by global events like wars or droughts. When the Ukraine war began, it increased wheat futures raising wheat-based product prices like bread or pasta. War is obviously inflationary. Before I digress, we will cover wheat futures in a future video. The history of food, especially fast food, is fascinating. During World War II, supply chains were really affected. Food rationing was observed and restaurants would serve smaller portions. As soon as the war ended, meal sizes became bigger and bigger until the 70s, when the government launched a campaign to fight obesity. As men came back from the war, there was a huge influx in the working class. The U.S. market was coming out of the Great Depression in the mid-1930s as people would eat on the go. This also led to the growth of restaurant chains like White Castle, McDonald's, and Burger King. Companies like McDonald's would spend decades softening the hard edges of their supply chain. Whether you like them or not, have you ever wondered why McDonald's french fries taste the same in D.C. or California or even Iowa? 
McDonald's fries come from the same russet Burbank potato, which is treated with the same insect called aphid that prevents necrosis or the thin lines formed on the inside of the potato. Sounds worse than the five second rule, right? The potatoes are of course processed with the same pesticide called Monitor to then get rid of the aphids. The chemicals are of course toxic and stored in climate controlled shelters so they can dissipate and the potatoes are safe to consume. So now that we have every single french fries and every single McDonald's across America taste the same, it's important to make sure the meat tastes consistent as well. Each vendor that supplies meat to McDonald's restaurants has to adhere to a long list of quality standards, to the extent that by just looking at the box of meat patty at a McDonald's, they can trace it back to which cow helped make that particular burger. Contrast that to Mr. Beast's meat patties, we got Whoa, 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 I'm, I'm not saying McDonald's burgers are great, I'm just saying with them, you know what you're gonna get. So while we're on this topic, let's take a look at how burgers evolved the last hundred years, especially meat-based burgers. There were all kinds of new seasoning, gourmet burgers with enhanced flavors, fusion burgers like teriyaki burger or kimchi burgers. Recently, there has been a demand for healthier burgers with grass-fed, sustainably sourced meats. But there was one common thing across the board. The basic flavor profile of the burger hasn't changed much in a century, and that says something about food disruption. Just the processes in the supply chain of food can be streamlined and made efficient, but taste? Not so much. So let's take a look at processes and how this would affect Mr. Beast. There was a trifecta of events that collided to transform the food industry. The first being the COVID-19 pandemic. There were so many structural changes possibly irreversible in the food supply chain after the pandemic, and the pandemic led to the growth of cloud or ghost kitchens. We already established that certain food profiles didn't change much, but the supply chain changed dramatically. According to a report from the National Restaurant Association, 110,000 eating or drinking establishments closed in 2021. Additional restaurants suffered due to the prolonged nature of the pandemic and the demand was affected leading to kitchen space. A new market opportunity emerged, as restaurants thought, why don't we apply the Airbnb model to open kitchen spaces? A niche industry of ghost kitchens grew at an incredible pace, reaching up to global market size of $71 billion in 2022. The ghost kitchen brands have all the upsides. Zero payments for service staff to serve sit-down customers. Zero setup cost risk that brick-and-mortar restaurants usually face. They probably don't have to deal with half the regulations restaurants face. The number of orders isn't really limited to the customers coming to the restaurant. Virtual dining concepts, Counter Suing Jimmy is one such cloud kitchen brand. The second part of the trifecta was delivery apps. I mean, Grubhub always existed, but post the mid-2010s, DoorDash and Uber Eats just revolutionized delivery, empowering every single restaurant to have the delivery service capability of a Domino's pizza. Partnerships were announced for fast food brands with McDonald's and Little Caesars Pizza teaming up with DoorDash. And the third thing was influencers. Personal brand connection and attention were harvested to sell products to customers. Logan sold energy drinks with Prime as the brand reportedly hit $250 million in annual sales. Kylie Cosmetics brought in $360 million last year. Emma Chamberlain's Chamberlain Coffee made a cool $9 million in revenue. And last but not the least, Mr. Beast Burger made $100 million in revenue last year. There was a convergence of mega forces like ghost kitchens, the world's best delivery apps, and consumer demand for celebrity influencers. Everything sounds perfect. What went wrong with Mr. Beast then? Before going into the Mr. Beast burger lawsuit, it's important to understand what the deal was about. Mr. Beast would be the face of the burger brand and would need to promote it and leverage his audience, while virtual dining concepts would bring in their decades of know-how about the restaurant business. VDC would basically find suitable restaurants with excess kitchen space and the ability to serve the Mr. Beast burger menu for patrons, mostly via food delivery apps like DoorDash and Uber Eats. I guess in simpler terms, Mr. Beast would bring in customers and VDC would be the operator, taking care of the quality taste and consistency part of restaurant food we talked about. Citing negative comments from customers like disgusting, inedible, and revolting, Jimmy filed a lawsuit against VDC stating that there was a lack of quality control.
and the company expanded their services too fast, adding 1,000 virtual locations in 2021 and another 700 in 2022. Mr. Beast did land in a little bit of trouble after that, as VDC countersued him for a whopping $100 million for disparaging the brand on Twitter. Interestingly, VDC said they were pressured into growing too fast by Mr. Beast, and they did so by securing partnerships with 300 restaurants across the country. They say that because of a handful of negative comments, which every restaurant brand faces, Mr. Beast tanked the brand himself on Twitter. I think Mr. Beast is in a bit of financial trouble, as assuming he's being truthful about spending seven to eight million dollars on all his businesses per month, and the fact that that's all he makes, he could now be liable for $100 million if VDC wins the suit. So going back to the lawsuit, let's examine the accusations of Mr. Beast. So ratings is the only objective comparison we can do, and to make sure we're comparing apples to apples, let's look at Mr. Beast Burger versus McDonald's and Burger King, because, well, they all sell burgers. McDonald's has 13,520 restaurants in the US with an average Google rating of 3.5. Now, this varies state by state, of course. Burger King has 6,850 restaurants in the US, and it also has an average Google rating of 3.5. Mr. Beast Burger, with about 1,700 virtual restaurants in the US now, shows two stars rating on Yelp, 2.7 stars on Grubhub, and on DoorDash, the range we found was between 3.5 and 4.4. So clearly, there are some issues that have popped up in the food quality and consistency across Mr. Beast Burger virtual restaurants, which VDC was supposed to take care of. But the soup here is Mr. Beast is blaming VDC for a setback to his brand. If Mr. Beast had researched the sheer measures a McDonald's takes to bring consistency to the table, or the processes White Castle sets in place, he would probably have taken a more conservative approach in shipping out all operations to VDC. He's also a get things done kind of guy as he makes mega production sets in the most unbelievable amount of time humanly possible. He should have known the diligence the restaurant business requires before ironing out the deal. I think he does know a lot about quality control now, as when you contrast that with Feastables, he has much more oversight over that brand. With Feastables, he knows exactly where the whole milk comes from, the grass-fed cows of North California. The Cocoa Beans and the Chocolate Bar is affiliated with the Rainforest Alliance, which has strict sustainability requirements for sourcing them. What's going to happen with this lawsuit, we don't know. And sure, Mr. Beast's heart was in the right place as he tried to help struggling restaurants grow their capacity in a time of terrible crisis, which is what Mr. Beast Burger was made for. But the next consumer market he enters, I am sure he is going to do a lot more due diligence.